Welcome, everybody. Welcome back. If you were just uh, listening to Lily Petrovic and Simon Blackburn, uh, this is going to be Act One, Scene Two of a philosopher named Simon. Today, we're going to talk with uh, Professor <laughs> Simon Critchley uh, from the New School in New York City. Um, my name is Jeff Sims. I'm a member of the Humanities Department at Vanier College. Uh, and just briefly, I'd like to say first, thank you to everyone who uh, has organized the event, but especially you, uh, Lisa Jorgensen. Uh, you've done a fantastic job and we really appreciate uh, your tireless efforts here. So mm -hmm. thank you, Lisa and the committee. Uh, and as we always do at Vanier College, we'd like to get started with, uh, before we get started, we'd like to uh, reiterate our land acknowledgement to the indigenous communities. So uh, let me say that as members of the Vanier community, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather as teachers, students, administrators, and staff is the traditional and unceded territory of the Ganagahaga uh, Mohawk First Nations, a place which has long been a site of greeting, meeting, and exchange among people, amongst peoples. Uh, today, it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. We acknowledge the Indigenous peoples and our connection to them, and we cherish our connection to them. Um, and so that said, let's uh, introduce uh, Professor Simon Critchley. Uh, Professor Simon Critchley is the Hans Jonas Professor of Philosophy at the New School in New York City. Let me just see if we can get a page down. There we go. He has been a visiting professor in numerous places, such as Germany, Norway, France, the Netherlands, Australia, United States. Uh, and he has conducted graduate seminars for the European Graduate School in Zasfe, Switzerland, and the island of Malta, south of Italy. Professor Critchley is the author of almost 30 books. Uh, that includes some of the following titles, The Ethics of Deconstruction, which is a very well-known uh, piece of work throughout uh, philosophical circles, uh, on humor, very little, almost nothing, death, philosophy, and literature, the book of dead philosophers, how to stop living and start worrying, <laughs> faith of the faithless, Stay Illusion, the Hamlet Doctrine with uh, Jameson Webster, Simon Critchley, Memory Theater, of course, very well-known work, highly acclaimed work, Bowie by Simon Critchley. And more recently in 2019, Tragedy, The Greeks and Us, and forthcoming, Bald, 35 Philosophical Shortcuts, which I'd like to know at least a little bit about. I hope we get to hear it. Uh, just a little bit about that. He has written, edited, and co-edited several reference works in philosophy, including uh, the much lauded Continental Philosophy, a very short introduction. Uh, Professor Critchley is also the author of numerous articles, some of which can be found in a weekly column that, mo that he moderates for the New York Times called The Stone. Uh, the, so the Stone was conceived by Peter Catapano and Simon Critchley in 2010. He's a member of the Onassis Foundation and whose recent podcast, Applydiger, uh, can be found on the Onassis YouTube channel as well as iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. And finally, not the very least at all, uh, it should be mentioned that Simon Critchley is a founding member of the band Critchley and Simmons. Uh, they have released <laughs> several albums on Spotify, iTunes, and SunCloud. So having said all of that, and that was just the tip of the iceberg, I could have gone on in a probably don't want me to go on. Uh, greetings, Professor Critchley. Thank you again for being here with us. Hi, Jeff, and hello, everyone. Nice right. to be back with you. Nice to be here with you, and nice to be back, at least, you know, virtually with Valley A College. <laughs> and here we are in February. We're making it through. It finally made it at least to February, so. Uh, and it was about five years, I think, ago that you were here. Uh, with us at uh, Vanier College, you were speaking on the topic of doubt. Uh, today, I thought that we would uh, just present a more rounded view of some of the ideas that you have uh, worked on over the years. Uh, in fact, I came across something in the Stone Reader, which where you wrote, the task of the philosopher is to try to talk, teach, and write about as much as possible and to let his or her critical eye fall on any and all subjects. 
Uh, and I thought mm -hmm. that this would be a nice way for us to sort of follow up uh, what are very prominent themes in the stone, uh, the, the uh, column, the stone in the New York Times, mm -hmm. and as it's found in the stone reader. So we thought we'd look at some philosophy today. We'd look at some politics, religion, and a little bit of science and technology. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, anything else that somebody else uh, would want to ask about. There will be opportunity for people to ask questions uh, in about 45, 50 minutes time, I suppose. Uh, and so you can fill in the Q&A section there and uh, ask Professor Critchley a question. Uh, so in, with respect to sort of casting our eyes around the world, uh, casting our eyes on these subjects, uh, Simon, I thought that I would ask you first and foremost to uh, look at the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room I think uh, is safe to say is the, and maybe it's more than an elephant, uh, the COVID-19 virus mm -hmm. and the pandemic situation that we're in. And I just had a question that uh, we'll, we'll ask you, is there anything revelatory or is there anything uh, different that you see about human nature or the human condition during this confrontation in the, with the pandemic? Right, yeah, well, um, hello everyone, nice to be here. And um, I think with the with COVID, it's um, it's something it's something new. It's a it's a novel coronavirus, and it's something old, in the sense in which, I mean, one thing that's defined human life for as long as there's been human life in in societies, towns, small groups, has been the um, has been plague, has been kinds of forms of pestilence, and um, and it's something that we, you know, it happens obviously uh, with the the so-called Spanish flu in 1917, uh, 18, and after that, uh, but we seem to have forgotten that. You know, we remember the First World War, maybe not as well as we should, but we forgot about the plague, and so it's. Um, I think it's a revelatory of the fragility of social life. That there are these plagues which have uh, devastating effects on human populations. And if you begin to, you know, plot that back historically, you find that, yes, I mean, you know, if we think about the, uh, the effects of the colonization of the Americas, uh, by right. Europeans and the way in which, you know, uh, diseases uh, played a role in the destruction of native populations. And, you know, it's, so in a sense, this is, this is something old uh, and it's, it's something that we kind of choose to forget because maybe we feel more invulnerable than we should. And so to that extent, it's a, it's a really, really good reminder. And then, and then philosophically, it's, it, it's a philosophical moment in the sense in which the, the COVID-19, COVID the pandemic, lockdown, isolation, um, all of those things that we've gone through have led people to really reflect on fundamental questions, um, which, can tend to get lost in the, um, you know, the hustle bustle, the hurly burly of day to day life, and what appears to be the things that appear to be constantly getting our attention. Um, whether it's you know Donald Trump's tweet feed or whatever it might be, and it, so it leads it's led us to really reflect on our our condition in a way that again is, it's, it's new, it's a novel coronavirus, but it's also old. It's something that in human beings, are, uh, you know, and in philosophy, philosophy is something that has to some extent taken place in a tradition of isolation and indeed incarceration in the case of Socrates, Boethius and others. So to that extent, although it's, it's a very bad situation we've had in the last year. Philosophically, it's arguably good. It's caused people to just pause and reflect and think about big issues in, way in ways in which they perhaps haven't done enough. 
and to think about what really is important in their, their lives. So to that extent, I kind of welcome it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you recently, you uh, were in an interview with uh, Andrew Zuckerman, Time Sensitive. Yeah. You said of the pandemic there, uh, this is what people should be experiencing. Now, I, I know that you don't think that people should be getting sick and dying from yeah. COVID-19, of course, but I mean, just I, I thought you'd, and I think you've already said, this is what people should be experiencing, which is to say uh, a reflection about their mortality. Is that what you're yeah. meaning? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, I, I, mean I, I begin, you know, I mean, my approach to, you know, my approach to things and my approach to philosophy as a way of reflecting on things begins from an idea of uh, limitation, an idea of human limitation and um, fragility. Uh, we are, you know, so when early in the in the in the pandemic, I was, you know, we were all reading different things and thinking about what really spoke to us now. But but someone that really spoke to me again, who was very important when I was um, a lot younger, was uh, Pascal. Yeah. And reading Pascal was um, was was was, you know, just it just reminded me of you know again the. That the human condition for Pascal is inconstancy, boredom, anxiety. That's where we begin, and uh, and so we're these weak, we are weak, fragile creatures that can be swept away by a little tiny virus that we can't see. It can destroy lives, and if we if we forget that and we think of ourselves as having these superpowers you know that we are invulnerable creatures and technology has given us superpowers with which we can you know overcome human limitation and uh, live forever if we're a kind of silicon valley billionaire the, these it's you know it's punctured all those delusions and again so it's pulled us back to something really really old and really important to remember that we the first the first step we have to begin with is an idea of, uh, of human limitation and that limitedness is um, and that you know what Pascal calls our wretchedness mm -hmm. um, is our greatness I think that's the important point is our wretchedness is our greatness in our limitation and in the fact that we are dependent on each other because we are fragile weak creatures who need each other uh, our greatness consists in in the fact of dependence and the fact that we are related to other people and we need larger social structures, friends, lovers, family, you know, society. We need these things in order to help us get by. So I think it's allowed certain, you know, we became more or less kind of individualistic patterns of thought to to be punctured and, and to seem rather silly. Um, I think that's, a, so that, that's also a good thing. I mean, this is not the way that we're born and bred and sort of raised, especially in this sort of Western liberal world. I, you know, we are taught to be, we have this persona, we, we're taught to wear these masks and that we're, as you say, we're individuals and we're powerful mm -hmm. and we don't weep and we don't cry and we get up and uh, when we skin our knees and. And in terms of dependency, well, every person should look after themselves. That's the ideal society when everybody can just look after themselves. And of course, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety and it creates uh, actually uh, the exact opposite picture of strength that you're describing with Pascal. Mm -hmm. this, this is the strong person. This is the person, uh, the, the one that you were describing a moment, moment ago, that's the weak person. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. yet, uh, and so it's, it seems to provide um, a certain a lot of confusion and anxiety and frustration. Yeah, but again, that's because we we because we forget things. I mean, you know, our, our weakness is strength. Weakness mm -hmm. is strength, and and our weakness, uh, our our combined, our collective weakness is our strength. The recognition of that. It's the problem. It, the problem of strength is the problem. The idea that you that you you're strong on your own and that weakness is something to be uh, avoided weakness is a is a failure it's a mission of defeat that's the, that's the flaw 
And so, you know, uh, and we can see that playing out. So we're not honest with ourselves. We're just not, we're just no. not honest enough with ourselves. No, and it's punctured. So I think it's, you know, it's punctured, you know, the, the, the idea that, I mean, if we, think, if we just go back a year, uh, the world was, um, you know, the, the, there were strong men in power, right? Strong men in power, like, uh, you know, Donald Trump and uh, Boris Johnson had just been uh, elected to a, a, a huge majority in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere, Bolsonaro in Brazil. Right. And then the effect of COVID has been to show the the ridiculousness of, of those kinds of positions that actually what is what is needed you know let's say governmentally at this point well firstly government is important being able to administer social affairs is not something which is kind of um sh should invite suspicion all the time as it tends to do in the united states where people have got this strong anti-government tradition but we need we need simple things like you know uh Public health, which which can be administered in a in a, in a quiet and effective way, and and so weakness is strength, and in a, and we have rich traditions which uh, which emphasise that. Um, for example, I mean, I'm not I'm not Christian, but that's I understand it. The core message of Christianity is that weakness is strength, and that was manifest in the fact that. God himself, right? Jesus Christ became the weakest, most vulnerable, suffering creature that there was. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting point. So, that the, so we have this uh, really silly idea of, of strength and, mm -hmm. uh, and self-reliance and, uh, and, and pushing through and not showing your feelings. We are, uh, this is in, in the words of a, a favorite philosopher of mine, Alastair McIntyre. Uh, this is, we are dependent, rational animals. We're rational, we have, we have reason, we can argue, we can think, but we're dependent. There's a, there's a limitation to what we can do. And we're dependent on each other. And we're certainly animals. And so it's a, it's a question of just, so I think, the, I mean, hopefully, 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 um, the upside of, the COVID pandemic will be to allow us to reassess uh, what 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 human life means and what we do together going forward. I, I I really hope that happens and that we don't forget. The risk, of course, is that we will just forget again, right, and right. we'll go back into some fantasy of strength and power, and we'll. Well, we'll go back to being rampant consumers. We'll go back to sort of an orgy of the world and the way that the world used to be. Uh, we're back and we can just... And, and so then the, what you're talking about then is, or you're asking the question, will we learn something from this? Because mm -hmm. it, it did happen to us. It's not... I, when I used to lecture certain, certain courses, uh, I would talk about the plague as if I knew something about the plague, you know, talking about the 15th century. Uh, 14th century. Uh, and so I guess that's an interesting question is that what are we going to, when everybody's vaccinated or the COVID virus, virus has disappeared, what will we go back to? And, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that what you express is something that we will, uh, uh, you know, partake of. That is to say, a reflection about our humanity as that just happened to us. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I guess. Yeah, I think it's, I think you know it's because of how that becomes the question of how history is how history is written, how history is told, and the the problem with you know we forget. I mean the um, I mean there was a the, I mean Montreal had a terrible uh, Spanish flu uh, epidemic. Mm -hmm. right it was it was yeah particularly awful, right? And mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean how prominent that is in how the history of the city, the place, the, is how prominent that is. I mean, but I think, but I think what's 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 worrying is what's worrying is that we, you know, we we remember. Let's say we remember the wars of the twentieth century, 
the First World War, the Second World War. And, you know, we can talk about the First World War and that, and that is also a war that had a very direct philosophical influence, right? Wittgenstein's Tractatus, right, right, uh, right. Lukács' History and Class Consciousness, Heidegger's work kind of comes out of uh, the, the what happened in, in the first, all, all of that. So we seem to be happy with remembering that, but we'd forgotten the Spanish flu. And, you know, there's a fact that I was, uh, became aware of recently was that, you know, when the, um, after the First World War and there was the, the meeting of Versailles, you know, the meeting where all the, you know, the powers were kind of carving up uh, carving up Europe and the United States was at that point, it was the first time it really played a, a definitive role in international relations in President Wilson. And President Wilson had the Spanish flu and he was very, very sick during those negotiations. And because he was sick during those negotiations, bad decisions were made. And, uh, and in particular, the, the French and the British were able to get concessions which they wouldn't have normally been able to get, right. which led to the, the Germany, you know, lost huge pieces of land uh, because of, you know, what was felt to have been, you know, fair in terms of what the Germany as the aggressor party in the First World War. And because, and that led indirectly to the Second World War, <laughs> you know, and where, you know, if you remember, you, you, again, we need to remember history that the Second World War begins with the, with, Germans saying we want our land back. We want these bits of land, and the reason they've Respect. been lost is because yeah. during the negotiations, uh, the, the the key negotiator, the the president of the United States, was sick. So it's it's what's worrying is the way in which we we'd forgotten all of that. So I worry in the future that we're going to forget we're going to forget about this in five ten years again, and the same thing's going to happen. And we'll find ourselves asking the same questions. So that really becomes a question of um, how history is told, and that becomes a question also of education. You know, yeah. how we, what we, what we tell students, and what students read and study. So yeah, yeah, I, I very much, uh, very much important what we choose to remember or how we remember it. I mean, you have said that. You know, we always think that we're through with our past, and yet the past is not through with us, sort of a, yeah. a Freudian note. Uh, the past is never through with us. The, the no. past always has some dealings to do with us. So if we charge on into the, the sort of post-pandemic world as if nothing has happened, uh, we're surely going to pay some sort of price for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it just seems inevitable that we'll pay some sort of price. Or that we won't have we won't have evolved. I mean, I, I see situations like this as an opportunity for humanity to take yet another revolution, uh, another turn in its evolution. Uh, and I, I just sometimes wonder if we just feel all powerful with science and technology that this is really nothing. Uh, you know, when these things come along, we'll just create a a vaccine and we'll just move on. Uh, yeah. We have this sense of power that we were talking about earlier. This, this we'll let the scientists deal with this. We'll let the medical community deal with this. Uh, this can't be happening to me, really. Yeah, it could have been much worse. Yeah, it's two things. I think the first thing that the there's a there's a really important, uh, hopefully, hopefully the um, the course of the pandemic allowed us to understand a little bit. Better. Again, something that is very old and very straightforward, which is what, what kind of thing science is. Science is uh, a modest enterprise. You know, it can it you know it proceeds by by hypothesis, and then you test the hypotheses, and then you see whether they work, and then incrementally, bit by bit, you can begin to explain a little bit of reality. So, with the virus, we we've seen that we've seen. Um, different experimental techniques used, you know, with the, with the Pfizer vaccine and so on, so on and so forth. New technology used to create a vaccine, that vaccine tested in a, a number of the population. And then we, we, we proceed, it's fallibilistic. It's, it's, uh, it has to be corrected. It's a modest, humble enterprise. 
Whereas we have this idea of science as kind of, you know, Elon Musk in outer space, you know, conquering the universe and living forever. It's not that. Science is an incremental, modest, slow process, uh, which, um, you know, and this is, so that, that's, that's the first point. The second point, when you mentioned the, um, you know, we're not through with the past, the past, the past isn't through with us. I mean, I took that line from uh, a movie by Paul Thomas Anderson called Magnolia, which okay. if people have not seen that film, then, you know, it, it's a huge snowstorm in New York today. So great day for watching movies, but Magnolia by Paul Thomas Anderson, it, that line just keeps coming back in that film. And he's thinking, we're not, we're not through with the past and the past isn't through with us. So, and the past isn't even past. Right? We we and we experience that in our uh, in our personal and familial lives. Right? We know that in our relationship to our parents or the people that you know bring us up. Those people are uh, you know, We might like to think that we're on our own and our own people, but we are we are dependent on frameworks of the past which continue to affect our behavior right so there's that sense at, at a, an intimate familial level that the past isn't through with us but also socially and historically the past isn't through with us so we have to we have to constantly i think the so i think the um the obligation of the um you know let's say the, the philosopher or someone that teaches philosophy the obligation is um to kind of ignore the future Right, the future, not not that it can take care of itself, but what's more important, what what people in the humanity can really do, is that they can draw our attention to the past, and show us stories about the past, which can act as a corrective, which can slow us down and remind us that we uh, we cannot leave all that stuff behind. We are dependent on it we are structured by it and it's part of who we are. And if we think we can escape that and move into some new outer space, you know, uh, mobilized by new forms of technology, I think, you know, we are hopelessly deluded. So I think, I think those two things are important that we've been reminded about the fact that we're these dependent creatures, dependent on each other, dependent on uh, wider institutional structures. Uh, we're dependent on, um, on on friends and family. We, we've uh, all another thing which is which has come up in a lot of my conversations with students over over Zoom because I've been te Zoom teaching as we all have in this period is a tremendous yearning for love and connection that people have at this point. People are alone and they're lost and they want some connection with someone. That's hugely important and. And also the, to, to remind you about the, um, it's a reminder about the nature of, of science as this minimal, modest, empirical method, which can produce, uh, can produce results, but over time and slowly, it does, it's not in the business of miracles, right? <laughs> and we tend to believe in miracles. That's right. <laughs> um. You know, you, you talk about the past in a way that a lot of philosophers refuse to talk about the past. You, mm -hmm. In Tragedies, Greeks, and Us, you talk about, in, you mentioned this idea of infusing our blood in the past, into the past, such that we can see ourselves differently. This is a sort of a her hermeneutical premise. But a lot of philosophy has sort of, I would suggest anyways, uh, Assume that we've been there and we've done that. Why should we look at the Greeks again? Why should we look at uh, you know Plato or Socrates or anybody the Greek tragedians? What, what, what of history? Aristotle said, for example, that the, the brain was a uh, an organism which cooled the body. So mm -hmm. for goodness sakes, why would I trust Aristotle with anything or anything that's over five hundred years old? There's yeah. there's a I guess a feeling when I look at philosophy and study philosophy. I mean, there's such a richness there, there's such a depth in the past, but it does have to be made into something in the present. 
but it seems like it's always there. It's always available if we look hard. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I'm a, you know, I have a, there's a, there's a certain tendency in philosophy. I think it's less prominent now, but it was certainly there, very powerfully, um, in much of the 20th century. The idea of philosophy as a as a science, you know, right. or right. Uh, certainly a, a, a kind of an underlaborer to science, as John Locke would say, and um, which was uh, which could provide a logical foundation for the sciences. And history was unimportant because history was just people getting things wrong. Right. And, um, and that's, I mean, that's, that's as far from my position as you can conceivably get. I think that, so I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in a sense more of an intellectual historian than I'm a philosopher. It's history that interests me. And, and in a way, I mean, all periods of history interest me, but the further back, the better, in a way. So, in you know, one thing that I've been doing in the um, during the pandemic was really reading and wallowing in ancient history. I mean, I mean, back to you know Mesopotamia and uh, the Egyptians and the Yellow River Valley in China and all these things, and and just thinking about well. Uh, what is it about these? How, how did human beings arrive at the forms of existence which which we find? And, uh, and even further back, I've been doing a lot of um, a lot of reading on um, the intersection between anthropology, uh, sorry, between archaeology and uh, and genome research. And oh, yeah. the thing that's really fascinating. Uh, there's a, there's a guy called David Reich who wrote a book called something like you know, Who We Are and How We Got Here, which I found really interesting. The way in which our model of not just ancient history, but kind of deep, I mean, Paleolithic, Neolithic, thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago, is being transformed by, by genome research. And the fact that we can, we can identify you know, the DNA and the genome structure of these ancient uh, relics like ancient findings and it's come it's allowing us to go up with a completely different picture of the deep past the deep mm -hmm. deep human past and i find that uh i mean that's you know on the one hand it's both um you know it, it's a scientific act it's a scientific interest in the sense in which these people are working you know with data with hypotheses with data but it also, it's a tremendous kind of, um, uh, it's also a work of imagination in the sense in which the two things that David Reich comes up with, as I recall it, I read this some months ago, would be um, the following. That if you look at, if you look at human history in over the, the last couple of hundred thousand years, right? Huge, big picture. Uh, there are two features. Uh, movement and mixing. So wherever there have been human beings, there has been mixing of different groups, right. and there's been movement from one place to another. And uh, and <clears throat> and it's an incredibly powerful picture. And you you know, and we've discovered in the last fifteen years an entirely new uh, form of humanity, right? Not Homo sapiens or Neanderthals. These people were Denisovans who were in who have been found from, um, from, from, from bone remains in caves in central Siberia. So the picture, the, the human story is much more complicated than we, we ever imagined and much more interesting. And that is also an imaginative task, right? In the sense that if we begin from the idea of movement and mixing, movement and mixture, then well, yeah, that's what human beings do and have continued to do. And so, and that means that if we, if we fixate on ideas of, um, uh, ideas of, you know, that we're, we, we all have some stable origin, some place that we're from, we, we have some kind of essence that defines us, whether that's understood racially or ethnically or whatever, these things are 
just wrong, empirically wrong. We are, we're compounds, we're hybrids, we're mixtures of different influences. And so there and is, a, sorry, there, there is this well, lacuna, there's a lacuna in this idea of culture. A culture mm -hmm. is a place from which I come from. It is my culture. Is, and I, I think that, you know, so things like even our, our modern day discussions of diversity and inclusion, these are absolutely essential discussions that we're having. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, as you're talking about this, they're not that new. Diversity and inclusion is nothing new and all the comp, uh, conflicts that come there with. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a, a it's, it's interesting what you're saying insofar as, uh, you know, cultures are just not these monolithic entities that, that house identities. And so this brings a certain problem to all the stuff that falls under the category of identity politics today. Uh, yeah. Because we become, we become representatives of identity. We become delegates of certain identities. And that is, uh, that is the, the basis of, I guess what Isaiah Berlin would have called just the basis of conflict. We, we come from all of these cultures and they are sort of monolithically uh, sort of imagined. We imagine them monolithically. And you say we need a new imagination to sort of undo some of this. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and again, it depends, that depends how you know, history is told. I mean, the, you know, the country that I'm, you know, happens to be living in the United States is obsessed with something called the American people. Right, right. Who are the American people? What does that mean? I mean, who, who decides? It's, 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 a, it's a fantasy. It's, it's a, an idea that there is some Americanness, or some essence to Americanness. Whereas, and that strikes me as, uh, and that's on the, on the right and on the left. Everyone right. talks that way. That's uh, right. Just a question of who gets included. I think you have to begin with a different picture. So, I think if you, um, I mean, one thing that I'm, uh, one thing that I'm keen on in general is the, is water, is water and, uh, and rivers and the sea. And if we begin to think about who we are in relationship to uh, the movements of people on boats, on ships, um, for thousands and thousands of years, and we begin to think about, we begin to imagine uh, culture on the model of the maritime, for example, then we end up with a di very different picture. So, you know, it's, I mean, where I'm from, uh, you know, Britain, and my family's from Liverpool, which is a port, and that's a uh, ports are interesting because they're defined by the sea. They're always defined by uh, this fluid medium through which people move. And uh, and what you end up with, well, if you, you know, this this will be a kind of a longer longer argument. But you end up with a much more kind of a diasporic uh, and and messy picture of culture if you begin with the uh, with water and the maritime rather than the land. The idea of land um, is, uh, is is you know, is is a, is a wrong concept to start with. I think we need right. to begin with an idea of uh, uh, of medium of, of exchange, and then you can think about that in relationship to, and also I think about this in relationship to aesthetic experience that um, that the. Um, I'm very keen on music. Right? I listen to lots of music. And um, again, music is something that we divide up in terms of certain identity claims and in terms of certain groups. The, the, the fantastic thing about say, American music, the music that's played say in the, you know, in, in the Appalachian mountains down through the South down to the Mississippi Delta and, and, and beyond that whole configuration is that it's an absolute mix and model of people and instruments and musical styles. Okay, I'm back. Okay, great. Well, I, I want to make sure that at least, you know, when we're talking about your philosophy too, um, that, we, that you could say something about your forthcoming book, uh, Bald 35 Philosophical Shortcuts. Right. I'm not sure 
I won't try to read the book by the cover. Um, so what, what could you tell us? Well, as you can see, I'm bald. Mm -hmm. So I'm making a case for the bald uh, to, to get their moment in the sun without getting skin cancer or whatever. So yeah, it's, 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 I thought it was a ridiculously, like a ridiculous way of organizing a book. Bald, baldness. So I, around I, around bald thinkers, then you've selected bald. Well, no. Well, basically, well, not really. Yeah, and it's bald in the sense in which, um, bald in the sense which well, it's actually bald, and um, bald in the sense in which, uh, I mean, one thing that I try to do philosophically is to be, is to be bald and bold, and not to, and not to, and not to speak. And not to use kind of academic wigs and comb overs and toupees and I see. philosophical hair transplants. There's 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 a tendency in academia to you learn to you learn to cover your head with the kind of elaborate wigs of jargon and uh, oh, and you can sound very clever while saying very little. And so my, I'm trying to make a stake for, make a case for bald statement. And the, so the pieces in the book are the 35, 35 essays that I've published in the last 11, 12 years with the New York Times. Okay. And um, so they're basically, so it, it's, it's, to that extent, it's a collection of those pieces. And one thing which is, been interesting about that experiment of writing for a newspaper is that you have to write boldly you have to write you have to make your points very fast and and try and grab a reader's attention and that's um that's a skill set which you're not really uh, you're not really provided with as, a, as an academic so i had to learn that it's not yeah. something that it's not something that Kant or Hegel could have pulled off, anyways. Mm. Yeah, I mean they could have. Well, yeah, no, they couldn't have. No, so it's 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 almost. So you know, where is you know where is philosophy happening in the the last decade or so? Well, it's happening in the kind of digital cave, mm -hmm. uh, not in the cave that Plato describes in the Republic, but in a kind of digital cave. And so learning to adapt uh, forms of philosophical thinking to that, that cave, uh, I think it's, 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 it's an important obligation. And the thing that I'm, you know, what I'm convinced of, and I can prove this by, you know, through evidence, through, through the, the readers that I've um, been in touch with over the years, is that... Um, if you can present philosophy in a clear and jargon-free way on topics which are actually topics which engage people, which are of interest, then they'll read them. People will read them. So the, the Stone, which is this project that I've been involved with since 2010, is the, it only happened because the back then in 2010, which in a sense feels like prehistory now, the, 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 New, the New York Times was still principally a print newspaper and they had a website where people used to have websites uh, but they didn't really care about that so we got uh, we got permission to kind of play in that website and uh, we developed uh, a readership we we learned something me and my my editor Peter Catapano we learned to through trial and error, what works and what doesn't work. And it's been a real adventure. And then as things shifted in the last six, seven years, increasingly towards online and digital, and now we're kind of fully digital, uh, we had a pre-existing audience, you know, uh, yeah. it's not, it's not, you know, it's not billions of people, but it's hundreds of thousands of people. And they are uh, people that are, you know, follow what we do and it's great. And the other thing that is interesting about those readers is they don't care who writes the pieces. They care 
who, whether they're any good or not. So when we started the idea of the stone, we thought we would have, you know, kind of famous philosophers, you know, celebrity philosopher types who'd be writing regularly for us. And this, and this didn't work. And instead what we found was that we would be sent pieces and me and Peter would read them and they would just be really good. And some people that I didn't know, nobody knew, uh, who were unknown, who then had something to say. And then you'd stick that material out there and then people wanted to read it. So it wasn't about, um, it wasn't about name recognition at all. It was about um, whether, the, whether the work was actually engaging and good. And there is something to be said for being able to, and this is also true in terms of students' work, of being able to state what you want to say crisply in 800 words or 1,000 words. It's an incredibly good discipline in a way that could be, that your grandmother could read, right? And I see no reason why writing philosophy should be something that your grandmother couldn't read. It should, it, you know, if, if the intuitions are important, they're, they're translatable to, for, for people that uh, have an interest. So I think that the way in which philosophers have hived themselves off, hidden away in academia, uh, with kind of illusory ideas of rigor and being scientific, I think is um, a little bit fraudulent. We, you know, our, our obligation is to you know, engage. Philosophy, I've always thought, is part of the life of culture, part of the life of culture. And at this point, that means, uh, you know, using the digital form um, and adapting to that. And, and philosophy can adapt pretty well, it turns out. It's, I think it's harder for novelists. It's harder for, you know, to get big books read but philosophy, short form philosophy for a, uh, you know, what we used to call the common reader back in the day, I think is, uh, is great. And I think there's also a real hunger uh, amongst people, young people to, um, to read and hear some of that. So that's good it, too. Uh, it's, it sounds like, that, uh, you know, you're breaking through what has commonly been traditionally been the sort of the cult of personality in philosophy where the big names demanded that you acquiesce to the big jargon to the big you know uh, the, the, the major pieces of work and of course all that's important yeah. that you understand something about the history of philosophy but I guess to resist the idea of imitation to imitate this style as you say to sort of put on a wig uh, to put right, on a right. Uh, I mean, is that is that going by the wayside? I mean, I say that because I think hopefully it is this this worship of you know the cult of personality in philosophy. Not that we don't have also you know thinkers that we privilege over others. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would certainly privilege a William James over a Freud. That's me. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm going to denigrate Freud or not read Freud. Uh, I just know that somewhere in my soul. I kind of privilege a thinker, but you know, yeah. we should be ready to criticize as well. And this cult of personality in, in philosophy, is that something that you tried to overcome when you wrote continental philosophy? Because you had two huge cults, if you will. Yeah. You, know, you had the Anglo-American, very scientifically oriented philosophy cult. And then you had the European, what you call the sort of emancipatory, the emancipation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, both had their strengths and their weaknesses, but were they, they were very cultic, weren't they? Yes, so, yeah. It's the idea that there's, you know, some in, in the continental tradition that there'll be some, some new prince or princess will come over the water and <laughs> give us a new paradigm and save everything. And uh, there's, a, there's been a whole academic industry connected with that. And I think that's delusional. I think that philosophy is local and local. it has to respond to local conditions. And it has to be about the place in which you live, work, and think. And that's going to mean a different thing in Montreal than it means in New York. And it's going to be a different, mean a different thing in Mexico City. It's going to be, right. and, that's, and that's fine. So the idea that there are just these um, 
that we can ignore that is, I think, so philosophy has to be local and attend to local traditions. And um, that, that's important. I think the cult of personality, I think, needs to be really broken down. I think there's, a, there's an obsession with, um, with rank, with status, with, uh, which is often reflected in institutional hierarchies, you know, that, you know, people in, say, the, the US are obsessed with the ranking of their departments or their university as opposed to other ones. And this is also something that turns around names and personalities and all of that. I think that's, I think it's, I think it's crap. I, I think it's, I have no, no patience for that. And it's, it's something which we need to, need to, uh, to get beyond. Oh, I think no. that, so I think philosophy, I think philosophy is, um, you know, this, 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 in, this in, a, in a way is a, is a great time for philosophy. Um, the online medium is very good for philosophy. There are immense resources which are available. Philosophy can work well in a short form. And, uh, and you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a fantastic world of stuff out there at everyone's fingertips. And, you know, the, the, the thing is for, 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 for students to feel that they can possess this make it theirs and do something with it that's that's what interests me so uh, when i think about my my teachers and what i you know what i got from my teachers it was a a, a feeling of a sense of permission a sense of license right that i was i was allowed to read this material and make the sense of it that I wanted to make. And I could be guided by my teachers because they had spent a longer amount of time doing this and they were often very clever and interesting people. But, you know, I, I think that, that teaching is not so much, and I don't see teaching so much as the, the, the transfer of inf information from one, from one person to another, kind of, you know, learn this stuff. It's about... Uh, creating the conditions whereby someone can has permission has has license to to to, to do something for themselves and um in, in, in that regard i'm very interested interest is the wrong word i've always been very attracted to the idea of the the autodidact um someone who teaches themselves right and, because I was kind of an autodidact. I mean, I had teachers, but basically I just, I spent time in libraries. I read stuff and I read some stupid stuff a lot of the time because I didn't know what I was doing. And then later on I was guided and helped, but basically, you know, we teach ourselves. So there's a, there's a, I think a really important tradition of the autodidact in, in education and in, in philosophy, which I think needs to be recovered. I think that in a sense, this might sound like a strange thing to say, that students have almost become mm -hmm. too dependent on, on, on being educated. All, the, all that we can do is say, well, here it is, you know, there's this stuff, yeah. there's, this, there's, there's William James. Yeah. Uh, why not spend a week or two reading this and that and the other. And then they might have questions and say, well, what does James mean by um, radical empiricism? Well, you can say, well, it, it means this. It means it's not traditional classical empiricism and it's not absolutism. What does that mean? But, so, but you can, and at that point, you, you possess it, you have it, you've got it, the student has it. And then with those tools in students' hands, then... Um, everything becomes possible. So you know, I do see, to that extent, I'm very, very old fashioned. I think, you know, education makes you free. It, you know, it, it makes you free and it gives you this extraordinary ability to, to make sense of things. And- But as you say, as I, when I worked my way up through the formal process of formal education, the one thing that I, I found that I had to be somewhat cognizant of is that there were people inviting you into the cult. 
Mm-hmm. And that you were, you were to learn the language of the cult, so to speak, the, the school. I should not always refer to it as a cult, but here's the school. You know, here's the founder foundations of the school of thinking. And now you have to learn the language and carry the message forward. And those teachers were better that didn't demand that or, or allowed us to break, break ranks. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you talk about the autodidactic student. And I, you think of a very eccentric person sometimes a very eccentric person, but somebody who stimulates new thought in a place and time, like Vico, who was Gian Battista Vico, largely ignored but self-taught. And, you know, the 20th century rolls around and says, well, look at all this stuff. This is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Why were we not paying attention to him earlier? Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really think that there's... Uh, a lot there that you're talking there's about. There's also there's also a kind of there's also um, uh, the, the the idea of the autodidact, is, you know, the self-taught person is also um, something which for me is linked to uh, to class, <coughs> to the social class, and the the um, you know I um, why is that? Because all you need is a library. In a sense, all you need is a library. All you need is a library, uh, and you know we have we have that at our fingertips, and well, right. yeah. and and um, everything is possible. And you know, and it's um, I was reading this book. I forget who wrote it. It was a it was a study of reading habits. It was a study of reading habit, working class reading habits from the 17th century onwards in the um, in Britain. And it was written by an American scholar, I forget the name, it was an interesting book. And a lot of it was statistical in terms of, you know, what, you know, what do we know about libraries in the 19th century, lending libraries, and what was being taken out and what were people reading? Ordinary people, uneducated people, what were they actually reading? Right. And, um, you know, in the minds of, uh, let's say, you know, contemporary left, the contemporary left bourgeoisie people, you would have thought, well, these people must have been reading, you know, Marx and thinking about revolution and all of that. No, they were reading Homer, they were reading Shakespeare, mm-hmm. and the most popular book, certainly in Britain, the most popular book was Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan crushes all the opposition and um, and so then you get this strange idea that actually there's this odd correlation between being an autodidact you know not having access to you know the best forms of education because they're for the the ruling classes and then you but what you can take possession of there is actually you know the classical tradition you can do it on your own terms. And uh, I think that's, that's really radical. So I love, you know, that's why I'm trying to get, always trying to get people to read Greek tragedies and, um, because, and to read them in, in, in really strange ways because these things are, you know, dynamite. Um, and, and you can make your arguments, you know, about how you're feeling and what you're doing. And you can say, well, and this is backed up by Sophocles. <laughs> and then people go, oh my God, really? That's impressive. So I do. All, yeah. all with some reference to, say, something that's going on in New York City or yeah. uh, something which yeah. is local, as you say. <clears throat> well, the idea that, you know, we, um, the idea of tragedy, uh, we, we're, we're constantly referring to things as tragic, mm-hmm. right? And what we, what we appear to mean by tragic is something terrible happens. Uh, there's an accident, it's tragic. Uh, there's a collision on the road, it's, it's, it's tragic. I always uh, think of that Aristotelian idea, the reversal from prosperity yeah. to misery, or from say health to old age, mm-hmm. from a good relationship to a bad relationship, just that idea of reversal. Everything turned when it wasn't supposed to turn. Yeah, but the tragedy is also is something that we we will that tragedy is something in tra- for tragedy to happen it's not something that just just befalls me 
It's something with which I have to freely participate. So, um, I mean, a good example of this was um, 9-11, right? 9-11, um, which felt like, you know, tragedy coming out of the skies, these, you know, planes going into the Twin Towers. If you look into that, the history of that, and you read what Azama bin Laden actually wrote, and he wrote quite a lot of gave speeches about this, um, and um, and they're very the messages of Azama bin Laden, which are very interesting. He says that one of his early memories, uh, one of his early memories was watching television in Saudi Arabia and watching the uh, the United States. 8th Navy, 9th Ninth Fleet, whatever it was, uh, bombard Beirut. This was when there was a, a war between, so, so-called war between Israel and, and, and Lebanon. And he saw on television uh, missiles going into towers. The front of the Beirut seafront was these extraordinary towers. It was the, you know, it was the, uh, the kind of Miami of the Mediterranean. Um, and... Um, he formed the idea that perhaps if you put missiles into towers, that would be that would be a thing. And if they're doing that to us, why don't we do that to them? The point of the story is that tr the tragedy uh, is something which we also are responsible for. We're involved yeah. in tragedy. Tragedy is something that we bring down on ourselves. It's not and something which is faded. We're complicit with it. We're complicit with it. So the, the fact that... 9-11 happened that uh, those planes went into those towers. That idea was an idea that the United States, the West, created. Right. It created that image in the minds of people who were being oppressed by it. And, and um, so tragedy is, uh, requires our complicity and, um, and, and in, in ways that I think we can find... Uh, we can find unpleasant because it means that, you know, if we end up with someone like Donald Trump as president for four years, we're also complicit in that. Right. right. Uh, and uh, Trump was probably complicit in his own demise. Yeah. I, I, I totally think yeah. so. Um, yeah. You know, going head to head with the coronavirus, uh, all he had to do was fake it. All he had to do was lie and say, we're working hard on it. And I think he probably would have won an election. A second mm -hmm. election, um, but you know uh, this this notion of tragedy is, you know, it's very deeply imbued in your philosophy too. That life has a, well, maybe not a tragedy, but a profound measure of disappointment in it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I thought you could just tell us a little bit more about. All right, is life fundamentally defined by its disappointment? That's where you begin. So my, my, my claim is, or my claim was, I mean, I, I, mean I, I still believe it, but I don't say it as much. Right. That philosophy begins in disappointment, you know, because people like the idea that philosophy begins in wonder. Because wonder is good, is much easier to sell, right? Wonder sounds wonderful. Everything is shining and wonderful and we can from that wonder we can feel, find peace and creation and blah 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 but you know look at the world <laughs> it's hardly a source of wonder it's a source of um crushing disappointment it seems to me so philosophy has to come begin from a sense of um the reality of the situation and a sense of what i called earlier human limitation human fragility dependence and the two forms of disappointment, which particularly, which which I which I worked on particularly, again some time ago, were religious disappointment and political disappointment. And religious disappointment is simply the idea that um, God is dead, the idea that whatever meaning traditional religion had promised us has evaporated and it's left us with this 
huge question, well, what is the meaning of life? What are, what are we up to? And that leads us into other areas, namely, are there other, are there other human activities which could, could make meaning in ways that are perhaps similar to what religion used to do? And that can lead you into questions of aesthetics and art and music and literature, maybe music you know, would be the sphere in which meaningfulness could be, could be expressed. So on the one hand, on the other hand, political, political disappointment is the idea that we begin from uh, injustice, that this is a, you know, human history is kind of um, a catastrophe. It's, it's, a, it's a piling up of wreckage. Um, and we begin from an idea of injustice and violence and um, and awful things happening to people that don't deserve it. And then we can begin to think about, well, what do we do? How could we begin to formulate a response to that in thought? And that, that's what leads me into, you know, the, the, the ethical side of my, my thinking, my views on ethics and morals and how we might construct a, a morality which would be capable of dealing with a world that disappoints and is, un is unjust. And that's something I've been, I've been trying to do over the years. So the point is, I mean, the kind of the, um, you know, in a nutshell, you know, philosophy begins in disappointment, but it does not end in disappointment. It ends in something like... An affirmation of... Affirmation, uh, a, a feeling, a, a, a courageousness, a sense of... Uh, uh, so I see no, so, I mean, I am, um, I, I'm Nietzschean in, Nietzsche is very important to me um, diagnostically. I think Nietzsche had some pretty silly views about things, positive views about things, uh, but he was really good at tearing things to pieces. And, um, and the side of Nietzsche that I really like is the idea there's no, there's, you know, pessimism and realism are where we have to begin and where we have to spend our time. The, the, the problem with the world is caused by optimists. <laughs> it's the optimists we have to worry about. And, and I agree with that. The, 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 we have to begin with a sense of the limitation of, of, uh, and the fragility of human affairs. Uh, we're gonna die, uh, all of those things. And we are, and we have to keep our minds there and, and then move courageously on from that and not begin from some, uh, some sort of, you know, fog of, uh, you know, wonder and enlightenment right. and energy and stuff like that, because that's gonna, that, all that's gonna lead to is narcissism and terrible feelings of moral superiority. Authoritarianism. <laughs> right. I, wa I want to make sure I get to some of the audience questions. Yeah, here. Do, yeah. Let's pick a few of these here. And uh, I'll start with this one. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the humanities about the sense of exhaustion with theory and with history. This is going back when we were talking earlier about history. So a sense of exhaustion with theory, with history, with the humanities, etc. Do you agree? What are we exhausted with exactly? I mean, I think the, um, I think the, um, I don't want us to be exhausted with, uh, with history. I want us to be very interested in history. With, I understand the, I mean, there was a certain, you know, the, the, <coughs> there was a thing that, there was a thing called theory, which was, uh, you know, had its heyday in the 80s and 90s um, in, um, in all sorts of departments and it was often linked to what you were calling before, you know, names, mm -hmm. big names. And uh, people would, you know, hitch their wagon to whichever big name they, they wanted. And then, and then, uh, and then it, it, it led to some terrible prose and it led to some, you know, some bad outcomes. Um, but the, you know, so I think we, that's, 
maybe that has faded from view. Um, I think the um, it is it's, in a sense what I want to say, which might sound odd, is that I think the moment is propitious for philosophy and the humanities. I don't know. I don't. I never. I never really know what the humanities are. You know. I always think, well, well go and ask us. So then. Well, yeah, but you sort of think, well, do you, don't you think you should defend the humanities? And I think what. What do you mean, the humanity? I never, I don't identify with the humanities. I was, and it always confuses me the word because I always think of manatees. You know those beautiful, strange creatures that exist in the the Everglades in Florida. And the, I, I, I want to defend the manatees. I'm just not sure about the humanities. But but philosophy, yes, I think that the time is propitious for philosophy. Philosophy is its time comprehended in thought, right? Hegel says that, and that's right. Philosophy is its time comprehended in thought. And we're living in quite a time, whichever way you look at it. And the task that's incumbent upon us, the responsibility we have, is to think that through. And... Um, but, but we're always eulogizing the humanities. We're always, buried, we're always lowering the humanities into the ground. Uh, yeah. Philosophy is dead. Philosophy is dead. In fact, that was Stephen Hawking who just recently is that philosophy is dead. Everything is up to science now. We don't need philosophy anymore. So this constant eulogy, except the next generation comes along, finds an empty casket there and says, well, I guess it's out here somewhere. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, Hawking, I have a... I mean, why, why, why does it live on so much? I mean, how does it live on so much? Well, how the humanities live on. You know, philosophy itself. Oh, philosophy, oh, philosophy lives on because, um, you know, um, it, human beings, if we just stay with the, 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 the traditional classification, let's say philosophy was something that the word philosophia appears in Greek two and a half thousand years ago, roughly. Certainly there's philosoph philosophy elsewhere, but let's just begin with that. Um, a number of questions are asked in the Platonic Dialogues. Um, none of them have been answered, right? None of those, none of those big questions have been answered. We're, we're just as clueless about questions of justice and love and perception as we were millennia ago. And there are different ways of looking at that. You could see that, well, this is, you know, Philosophy is just a, an exercise in, you know, gassing and kind of failure. Or you can say, well, there are questions which need to be investigated. There are questions which cannot be answered, which have to be ruminated upon. And uh, that's the way I tend to see it. Now, if we turn to someone like Hawking, you can't criticize Stephen Hawking, but I will. I think, the man, I think the man is kind of, it was a Philistine in a sense. It was, uh, and he was, he was succumbing and he, allowing other people to succumb to the delusion that theoretical physics could give the definitive answer on nature. What is the, what is nature? What are the origins of the universe and so on and so forth. And at that point, all philosophical questions kind of are silenced. And Neil deGrasse Tyson does something not dissimilar in his work. Um, I take a different view. I take, I'm, I'm close to someone like, you know, William James, who I'm enormously fond of. I'm, I'm, uh, I think science is really, really, really important. And, um, and, and, but science is, it's piecemeal. It's, it's, it's fallible. It works incrementally. It's a much more modest enterprise of approximating to a reality which continually retreats from it it's so science for me is much more like literature right i think there are two you know this this is an idea i i've taken from someone who influenced me a lot when i was a, when i was a kid it's called jacob bronowski uh -huh. jacob bronowski was a you know a popular scientist of his day a, a, a top theoretical physicist and he, he says broadly, there are, two, there are two paths that the imagination takes. One is a scientific path, and one is the path of, say, art or literature. 
But these paths are analogous and they're both essential. We can't, we can't uh, get to a position where we think that one science, as it were, disqualifies the other. Right. We, so, it, so someone like me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fully paid up, you know, subscriber to the scientific view of the world, but that doesn't exhaust the questions that philosophy asks. It, it just shows us the space which those questions need to operate in. And so there's still a gap between huge gap. Yeah. And I think if you look at, think about this, you know, think about this in relationship to um, uh, big tech. I think this is a very interesting issue. Um, there was a certain delusion uh, which people like, my, people like Mark Zuckerberg and others were succumbed to that in, in their terms, that engineering, you know, computer engineering, software, the right kind of engineering can basically solve the big problems, can give us an account of that which is, it can allow, uh, you know, just think back 10 years, people thought Facebook was about, you know, friends and connection and sharing, and it was going to lead to good things, right? So, so they were, here were people that thought that engineering, computer engineering, was a, was a, you could mainline into reality through that, and the outcomes would be morally beneficial. That's been proved horribly, horribly wrong. Right? And, it, and, and the opposite is the case. It turns out that those mechanisms which have been put in place, social media mechanisms, are ways of creating division, hostility, suspicion, and circulating misinformation, all those things that we're familiar with. So now you find uh, a lot of people in Silicon Valley desperately trying to hire ethicists, hire humanities people, anthropologists, sociologists, can actually figure out uh, what's going on. Because the ways in which human beings make meaning is not just an engineering problem, right? Oh, it, yeah, and so... Uh, well, it's this computational model. You know, the brain is computational, therefore, look what we have over here, great computational equipment. Mm -hmm. and so there's this immediate sort of, you know, look how fast that machine can do that, that, that technology can do that. Yeah. So well, this, this sort of computation, I, I, think there's, I think we're still suffering a metaphor. I mean, yes, we're computational, but I'm not sure that's all that's there, you know, this... This idea that the brain is computational, so let's get the best computator, that, you know, computer that we can find, and use it instead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I think I think a lot of um, you know a lot of you know if we look at the um, again, this is also tragic. That let's say that let's say that Mark Zuckerberg and the founders of Facebook had good intentions. Let's imagine they had good intentions. They want to get rich and change the world, but they had good intentions. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to accept that. But those good intentions have led to bad outcomes. And uh, they're complicit with that. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. And in order to address that tragedy, engineering is not going to provide the answers. It requires... What does it require? It requires a thinking through of the ways in which human beings make meaning, organize things, and, and, and think things through. The humanities, philosophy of the humanities, give us a 3,000 or at least a 3,000 year archive of thinking through that stuff. Right. The most precious resource imaginable. Um, and so I think that the, I think every generation. I think every generation suffers from the delusion that it can do without reflection on fundamental questions that don't have obvious answers. It can do without philosophy. And every generation is found, found wrong. And we find ourselves running back to those same questions. And again, I think go, to go back to where we started with COVID, I think that's, um, you know, we, we might have thought that we were through with all sorts of issues. And we find ourselves in COVID, those things coming back in an incredibly powerful way. I mean, for example, I mean, what is the relationship between the mind and the body? <laughs> you know, we've been 
bodies locked in rooms for the last year, um, either within in, in our bubbles, our families, or on our own. And um, people have been, um, a lot of people have been suffering from a wide range of hypochondriac symptoms. I know I have. And, um, and hypochondriac symptoms that you know are not real, you know, you can get a test and find out if I've got COVID or not. But there's something about the mind-body complex that is just complicated. And at that point, yes, we need medical science. We need all the help we can get from that. We also need, um, we need, we need Shakespeare. We need the work of poets and, and thinkers uh, who can, who reflected on the depth and gravity of the human condition. So it's, it's these things that ameliorate the the relationship between mind and body, which I think is antagonistic. It's an antagonistic relationship. Yet, what can ameliorate that? What can sort of soothe that or heal that somewhat is yes, the Shakespeare's and the yeah. reading of everything else. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'm um, so I'm teaching a class this semester, uh, which I'm calling pandemic mysticism. And so I'm looking at the, um, the fact that we've all become hermits. We've all become, whether we wanted to, we, we, whether we didn't, we weren't asked. We, you know, we, we didn't ask for this. We've become hermits, monks, and nuns. We're kind of sitting at home. Um, we've engaged in these processes of, of retreat, isolation, um, separation and feelings of you know the noonday demon of depression sadness melancholy right. again there's a whole tradition of reflection on this in the in the um, in particularly in the christian mystical tradition so i'm teaching that and it's um it's fascinating to do because when you and also doing this on, on zoom is fascinating because uh, I can connect with people in a much more intimate way by virtue of distance. That's, that's another peculiar thing that I would never have thought about a year ago. That I've found, although I know that this Zoom, you know, it sucks and people are bored with it, they're exhausted with it and all of that. That's, that's, that's fair enough. On the other hand, if you get a small group, a decent group, number of people, a small group of, of people, you can have certainly in sort of teacher-student relations that I've experienced over the last year, profound experiences of intimacy, familiarity and trust, which are made possible by distance. And, uh, and we all look like idiots. I'm at home with my sports clothes looking like an idiot. Everyone looks like an idiot. Oh, you look so bad. You look okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great kind of there's a great kind of it, it, yeah. it's it's a leveling which is which is I think in a sense quite quite liberating and so I think that uh, um, yeah so I think it's um, well, well let me squeeze in a couple questions more I mean yeah we, okay we have one more from the audience we're going to come up on the hour here the half hour so I think we'll have to be careful but. Uh, well, let's get the, uh, we're finishing what, in, in 11.30, right? I think it's before 11.30, yeah, just before. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, our, our common question that we're asking everybody is something like this. Uh, what changes do you see or have you seen in yourself in the world, the com most compelling changes that you find disturbing or hopeful? Where does the concept of, of change really make itself felt in your radar? Well, I mean, it, it, this would be a kind of, you know, there's a, a lot, there's to be a little bit somber, but this is, connects back to, I think, social media. Social media is a significant change. I think human behavior is surprisingly, doesn't change, changes less than you would imagine over huge historical periods. Uh, social media, the last 15, 20 years, I think of, either initiated something new or have accelerated uh, latent potentials that were there. And so but this, 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 let me, yeah, yeah, on a rather sour note, I did, I wrote a book on, um, called Notes on Suicide. Right. And um, a little book. And I did a new edition of that that came out at the back end of last year. 
And uh, I wanted you to do a new edition because I've been reading a lot about the relationship between, so between social media uh, and mood disorder, depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide. And the thing about uh, suicide is that the, the trends, the statistics, uh, they, they shift from place to place, but they're, they're fairly constant. And the gender distribution of them is fairly constant. Um, and long story short, in the last 10 years, there's been a profound shift. Profound shift in feelings of suicidal ideation, depression, and in many cases, suicide. And that seems to have uh, had an, incre an, an incredibly high influence amongst preteens and teens, teenagers. And in particular, that's had an effect on, uh, on girls rather than boys or young women rather than young men. And I think that's, that's a really hugely significant change which needs to be attended to and legislated and thought through. And we're not doing that. So I think the, the effects of, say, um, cyberbullying, uh, Instagram bullying, whatever it might be, uh, on, on, on the mood... Of, of, of young people, young young men too, but I think in particular young women, I think is a is a kind of uh, public health crisis which is uh, which is going on as we speak, and that really needs to be firstly acknowledged and and thought through because um, bad things are happening, and um, this social thing, media needs greater regulation. It's, you know, the question that this is the question, right? I mean, can you, is this a Pandora's box that once it's opened, you can't close? Um, maybe, but I think, you know, if you think about the, in the EU, at least, at least in a sense, after the box has been opened, after the horse has bolted, there is much more aggressive legislation on data privacy and what the big social media companies can and can't do uh, none of that has happened in the United States. And in fact, the opposite is the case. And the actual effects of, of this, you know, are, are very real and are felt in, um, in ways that don't really get reported. So I think the, I mean, without going into too much gruesome detail, um, there's been a, you know, this is borne out by a whole number of studies, and I'm, I'm, I'm leaning here on the work of Jonathan Haidt and Jean Tvenger, who've been putting together all of the studies of what we know about uh, mood, mood disorder to suicidal ideation in a number of different contexts. The studies are based largely in Britain, the United States, Canada, Australia, because that's where uh, a lot of the studies are being done. And the, the news is really bad, and the news is really bad in particular for the, the effects of social media on, um, on the feelings of mood um, in young people, particularly young women. And that needs to be um, addressed and thought through and um, whether you can, whether that can just be legislated away, I don't know, but at least it needs to be recognized as a, a major public health crisis because this pandemic is one thing. This is real. What we're going to go into next is a is a is a kind of um, you know um, a kind of psychosomatic pandemic. We're going to go through a pandemic of the effects of last year, uh, and we're going to feel those effects in all sorts of ways. Yeah. I think we might. We, we, I'm not sure what happens at this point. We might time out, but uh, maybe this is a good time to wrap it up, and maybe we should think about what you just said there. Uh, we can all stop and pause and reflect about uh, that. Yeah, I can so, send you something I wrote on that. If anyone's interested, then they could just I can send that through. It's a little of the preface I wrote. It's it's a it's a very kind of sober study of uh, discussion of, uh, of social media and mood disorder. If anyone's interested in that, and I can point you to some resources. It's a very important issue. It seems to me. Well, anything you send me, I can send on to uh, the department and, and it'll get moved around. So that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And we really uh, very much appreciate you coming back to talk with us. Uh, we uh, just can't say thank you enough. Well, thank you, Jeff. And, uh, you know, stay safe and we'll, we'll see each other on the street somewhere. I hope so. 
And good luck. Thank you to everybody out there in digital land in Montreal for listening. And I, I wish you all well. And, um, you know, you know, for, the time is propitious for philosophy, is what I want to say. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Most of right. it. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.